believe that we can exalt God in our minds that we're going to see a major difference in our spirituality. Um, our perception of God, of course, He's everywhere, but we know when we talk to Him, we look into heaven. And if we can get a perception of Him there and His glory, I think it's going to make us uh, stronger Christians. Now, I want to read from 1 Timothy chapter 6, first of all, and beginning in verse 14. Keep this commandment without spot, unstained, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in His times He shall show. Now listen closely. Who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lords, uh, Lord of lords? Notice verse 16. Who only has immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Notice in that last verse again, dwelling in light which no man can approach unto, no man seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now, there are a lot of attributes of God, and we could have a sermon on each one of them, but I just want to just quickly remind you of some of the attributes of God. Um, there's a term that's thrown around that's omnipotent, which means that He's all-powerful. That means totally He has all power. Um, now, present means He's present everywhere at the same time. Another one is um, omniscient. That means that He knows everything. And, of course, He's immutable. means that He can't be changed, unchanging. Uh, he's eternal, has no beginning and no end. He is just and righteous, totality of justness and righteousness. He's holy. As your Father in heaven, the holy be ye holy. Remember that exhortation from Peter? Um, he's good, of course. God is good. We sing that song, God is good. God is good. God is true. God is merciful. God is love. And we could probably add some others to that too. In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, we have this verse, a very basic principle. And that is, But now, O Lord, You are our Father. We are the clay. And You are the potter. And all we are the works of Your hands. Now think of that phrase again. You are, we are the clay. You are the potter. And so, we should be so responsive to God that He can take us and mold us the way that He wants us to be, like a potter would take clay and mold it into that which He wants it to be. Um, he knows, of course, everything we need before we ever ask Him. Matthew 6, 9, of course, familiar verse says, Your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. That's one of the great traits of God. He knows that before we say a word to Him of gratitude or request or whatever it is, and that we know we have a very intimate relationship with God if we're totally faithful Christians. From Matthew chapter 10, a very familiar section, verse 29 and 30, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will? So you see a dead bird. It was the Father's will that that bird die. And He knew about it. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you're more valuable than many sparrows. So right now, God could tell us how many hairs in each of our heads. Now, some of you have fewer hairs than others, but He knows what they are, and that's amazing. That's that intimate relationship that we have with God, or whether we do or not, He still knows that, even about a, a, a rebellious person, a non-Christian. God knows that. He's the Father of lights. Um, every good gift comes from Him. In fact, in the study of James a few weeks ago, in James 1.17, we found those verses. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow cast by turning. So He doesn't vary, and He doesn't turn His head and our body and makes a, a, a shadow, but He's always static and the same. And every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from Him. So I think the more that we can think about heaven, heavenly things, heavenly things where God is, it's going to be easier to live a Christian life. 
So I want to concentrate on God, but just one aspect, actually. I want to think about the throne of God. Uh, scriptures talk about it. Let's talk about that throne this morning. Now I want to ask you, when you pray, what do you visualize? Now, you know, I don't want you to answer out, but each of you probably has a concept when you pray. When I pray, I, I see that throne area. Like Stephen, I mentioned him in a few moments. Stephen looked up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at his side. So when you pray, is there just an abstract openness there? Or do you see in your mind, your concept of the throne of God and God seated on it? Uh, that term, His throne, is used 61 times in the New Testament. And it denotes rule and power and authority, of course. 46 times in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 4, it's used 13 times, talking about the throne of God. Now in Matthew 5, verse 34, Jesus calls uh, heaven, you know what He calls it? God's throne. Here's what He says, But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God. Then in Isaiah 66, in verse 1, calls heaven God's throne, just like Matthew did. And here's how it reads, Thus saith the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Now we don't use the concept footstool that much, but obviously it's a place where your foot, uh, stool that your foot sits on. So it seemed to be the picture of this, that there's a major, magnificent throne in heaven. God sits on it, and the stool that He puts His feet on, so to speak, is the earth, us. We are His footstool. So you get that concept of the greatness of the throne of God. Psalm 45 verse 6 says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, is a scepter of your kingdom. Your throne, O God. Matthew 23 verse 22 says, And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God, by Him who sits on it. So, Jesus, after He accomplished His work here, of course, ascended into heaven and is now on the right hand of God. Now, right hand denotes authority. But I, that's kind of the picture I get when I pray. I can see, of course I can't see God, and nobody has seen Him can, but we have a perception of His greatness. We have a perception of that glory of, of His of, uh, the throne. And we got perception of Jesus standing or sitting. I think he's standing in case of Stephen because there was a martyr being stoned to death. And Jesus stood up to, to say it, to see it, so to speak. And I think if we can have that kind of concept, it's going to help us in our prayer. So when we pray, so to speak, Jesus is there at the right hand of God's throne, with God seated on it. And he's our intercessor, he's our advocate, he's propitiation through whom we can pray, and then He'll take our prayers to God the Father. Now, I like to have that perception when I'm praying, and I want to suggest if you don't, give it a try. Then in Acts 7, verse 55, alluded to several times already, that's, that's Stephen. Stephen, a great martyr, of course, serving God, but was stoned to death. Paul standing over here holding the clothes of those who were, or cloaks of those who were throwing those stones at Stephen. But verse 55 says, Acts 7, by one of my favorite verses. But he being full of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at his right hand and said, Look, I see heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And you talk about a scene. Wouldn't you love to be able to see that like that? Stephen's here dying, but he looks up and says, Look, I see, I see heaven open. And I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of God. But notice what he saw before that. He saw the glory of God. Now in Romans 8 verse 34, Jesus, we're told, is at the right hand of God. As I alluded to a moment ago, He's at the right hand of God interceding for us. So let's read this verse, Romans 8 verse 34. Who is He who condemns us? He answers, 
it is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So he intercedes for us. It's called an advocate. And in 1 John chapter 2, an advocate is one who pleads a case or cause. And so he's tempted in all points like as we, and so we can pray through Christ. He understands us. He's been through it all. And he can take that to God the Father. And Colossians chapter 3, again among my favorite verses, there are about the first four verses. Uh, it talks about seeking the things which are above and not the things that are here on the earth. Now, if you remember in Colossians 2, verse 12, we're told that we're buried with Him in baptism. And if you ever talk to someone that thinks sprinkling is baptism, this is a good verse to know. Buried with Him in baptism. And so he begins verse 1 in chapter 3 of Colossians this way. If you then were raised with Christ, well, what does that allude to? That's when you were baptized in the water and you were raised with Him. So if you were raised with Christ, chapter 2, verse 12, buried in baptism, Seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your affection upon things above and not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Isn't that a marvelous verse? If you've been raised with Christ, if you've been buried in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, then He says, Seek the things which are above. That place where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind or affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Or you die. Now remember, when we were buried in baptism, we have to die before you're buried. We die to sin, and then we were buried in baptism. So we'll go back again to thought. He says, for you died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. What thought? Our life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Isn't that a beautiful promise? You and I are going to appear with Him in glory. Now a throne, of course, is a special place. It's a special seat. And it's reserved for a monarch. It's really what it is, a king. So when the Bible talks about God's throne, it's an emphasis on God's dignity, His greatness, and the sovereign rule. It just says He is the one in control. He's on the throne. And all these people in the world, some of them think they're great. No, He's the one that's in control. He's on the throne. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1, Isaiah sees the Lord. And here's how he describes it. He's high, exalted, seated on the throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Now the train is, you know, like people wear robes and they have a, a portion of trails on the floor. So it, it's a, uh, Isaiah said, I see God high and exalted upon that throne. And I see the trail of his robe. It fills that temple. Now how much of that is figurative language? How much literal? You know, I don't know that God has a robe on all the time, but the concept is there. It is, isn't it? And so the um, throne of God is a place of sovereignty. It's a place of holiness. Uh, Psalm 47, 8 says, God reigns over the nations. God is seated in His holy throne. Now I find that a comforting thing. So we get into politics and we get into all those countries in the world and they're dominating and they are bad things here and bad things there. But listen, Psalm 47 says that God reigns over the nations. They don't know it. They think they're doing it. He says God reigns over the nations. He's the king. He's the one that sits on the throne. And I find comfort in that. And 1 Peter 3.22, Christ at the Father's right hand has all of the spiritual realm subject to Him. Now let me say that again. Christ sitting at the right hand of God the Father has everything that's in the spiritual realm subject to Him. So 1 Peter 3.22 reads this way. Who has gone into heaven is at the right hand of God angels, authorities, and powers having been made subject to Him. Did you know angels are subject to Christ? 
Did you know authorities subject to Christ? Now, if you read in context, I think you'll see it's authorities in heaven. Uh, the powers that be in that spiritual realm, they're all subject to Christ sitting at the right hand of God who is subject to God who is sitting on the throne. And then, particularly when you look in the book of Revelation, you're going to see the throne of God with a tremendous emphasis. Now, in Revelation 19, 4 and 5, we have a sort of a continuation of the thought at least. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sits on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And a voice came from heaven, saying, Give praise to our God, all you His bondservants, you who fear Him, the small and the great. So that tells me then that worship is directed toward God, doesn't it? So the voice came from heaven, saying, Give praise to God, all His bondservants, you who fear Him, the small and the great. That's why when we worship, it's, it's an upward thing, isn't it? We're worshiping God. Now I want to ask you, and I don't mean to be critical, but let me just ask you to be perfectly honest with yourself. When we were singing a while ago, um, praise, did you feel that direction in which you were directing what you were doing? Did you, did you get that sensation as going up? that you're praising God. That's what worship is. It's directed toward the one that's being worshipped and God is in heaven on the throne. And so our worship is directed, directed in that upward uh, fashion, isn't it? To God the Father. And I think if we'll, we'll be conscious of that while we're sitting singing and, and praying and such like, of course, it's that's the one that we're worshipping right there. Um, then in Revelation 4 or 5 again, and out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and pearls of thunder. There are seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And then chapter 6 and verse 16 of Revelation. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne. Why? They recognize his greatness. And from the wrath of the Lamb, that would be the Christ. For the great day of their wealth, our wrath has come, and woe, and who is able to stand? So the punishment comes from that throne, as well as the praise goes up to that throne. Now in Revelation 7, verses 9 through 11, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one can number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hand, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. Now that throne of God is a marvelous thing, but that throne also represents judgment of those that are not prepared to meet God. Now we can talk about God in generalities, but when we begin to perceive the perception of Him on that throne, what about all that are not prepared to meet Him? Scary is what it is. But it also represents mercy and grace to those who are serving God. So yes, it's a judgment for those unprepared. But for us who are prepared, and I trust uh, many of us here are, then it represents grace and mercy from that great God who sits on that throne. That's why Hebrews 4 verse 16 says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Why? So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So when we approach that throne, we being in Christ, He says you approach it with confidence because you find grace and mercy there. Now one day, as you know, the Bible teaches that every, all of creation will have to bow to Jesus who sits at the right hand of God the Father. In Philippians 2, beginning in verse 9, we have these. God also has highly exalted Him, speaking of Christ, and given him the name which is above every name. Now listen closely. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall, should bow, 
and those of those in heaven, and those on the earth, and those under the earth. And that every time she confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. How they exalted him that and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. So now you've got the picture of God sitting on the throne. You have Christ there at his right hand. How to exalt him. That at his name every knee will bow. Both in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It would be too late if one not prepared though. But everybody's going to confess Christ is that one. But it's too late then. Now we know the Scripture in 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in the body, whether it be good or bad. Now that's a sobering thought, isn't it? This one that is sitting now at the right hand of God the Father, the Scripture says, I must appear before Him. You must appear before Him. Every human being must appear before the judgment seat of this Christ who is standing at the right end of God the Father. Why? Because this Jesus is going to judge every one of us. I'm going to be there. You'll be there. Everybody's going to be there. So again, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done whether good or bad. Sobering verses, aren't they? The picture of that great white throne in Revelation 20. And uh, in verse 11, let's begin reading. And I saw a great white throne and Him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. That's a great white throne in the set on. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. They were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, and that's the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now you want a sobering statement, brothers, sisters in Christ, and ladies and gentlemen, listen to that one. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Anyone's name not in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. That has no end. It'll burn forever and ever and ever and ever where the worm dieth not and the fire he is not quenched to put out. So an exhortation 1 Timothy chapter 6 beginning at verse 14. His commandment without spot unstained until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which in his times he will show who is that blessed and only potentate the King of kings the Lord of lords that are right earlier who only has immortality dwelling in light which no man can approach unto. Now that's what we mentioned earlier. Where, like Stephen saw that glory of God. Now, you think about it. Who created the sun? The answer is, I'm talking about S O S U N. God created the sun, didn't He? Now, if you go outside on a sunny day and you said, you know, I'm going to look at that sun. It's 93 million miles away, if I remember correctly. And you can't look, can you? Unless you have a sunglasses on or something. Now, let's move you or me. 93 million miles and look at something that God created. You're 93 million miles closer to it. You think you're going to be able to look at it? Well, that's not as bright as God Himself is because He created that thing. So when we talk about the glory of God, just amplify, I mean, maybe somewhat close to it, at least 93 million miles closer and look at the sun, the S-U-N. And you're going to get a little glimpse of what the glory of God 
is life. And that's why when it says, who only has immortality, dwelling in light, which no man can approach unto, that no man see, no man can see, to whom be honor and power and everlasting. So you see, that light is the glory of God. In Acts 7, 55 again with Stephen, he being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfast into heaven and saw the glory of God. I want to see that, don't you? I long to see the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. First Timothy 6, 16 again, who only has immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man seen or can see, now, of course, the major question. I want to go to that throne. I want to see Jesus there. I'm not fearful of standing in that judgment of you. I long to be there. I'm going to be there. And you're going to be there too. We all are. The ones that I'm really concerned about are those whose names are not in the book of life. Again, Revelation 20:15. Anyone not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. I know if your name is not in the book of life, you're not going to be saved. And you're going to have damnation throughout all eternity without Him. So the best friend I can be to you is tell you the truth. The Bible says that we must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You remember those brethren in Acts chapter 2? When they recognized they had killed Christ, they said, Men and brethren, what should we do? And Peter said, Repent. And be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. We saw in Acts 2.12, Baptism is a burial. We see it in Romans 6, verses 3, 4, and 5. Buried in baptism. Uh, the Bible is just replete with that. Rise, be baptized, and wash away your sin. 1 Peter 3.21 A like figure when the baptism is also now save us. No one not baptized into Christ is going to go to heaven. I hate to say that. I'm sad to say that. But that's the truth. That's how important it is. Anyone not found written in the book of life. Now, what if you and I, though, our name was written there. And I trust that happens the moment we're baptized the way I would understand it. So to speak, God puts our name in that book. But what if we don't live faithfully? Well, there's a verse also in Revelation that I think we ought to be aware of. Revelation 3, 5. Uh, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not body's name out of the book of life. What's the implication there? He that overcometh shall be clothed in a white raiment, and I will not body his name out of the book of life, but I'll confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Isn't the implication that if a person doesn't overcome, now these are Christians here, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And if you overcome the sin as a Christian, I will not blot your name out of the book of life. But isn't it implied if you do not overcome your sin, that our names will be blotted out of the book of life? I, I can't. I, I would challenge you to think of anything sadder, more sad than that one. 